Welcome to this episode of Out of Country. Out of Country is a leadership and philanthropy series where I sit down with ordinary people who have done amazing, inspiring, volunteer and even philanthropic work in other countries. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Annette Stanwyck. Annette is a speaker, author, freedom facilitator and coach, a healthcare professional and a leadership consultant. Thank you so much, Annette, for giving me the pleasure of this interview. Well, thank you, Terry, for the invitation. I really look forward to spending time with you. Same here. Yeah. Now, I first met Annette when we were both members at the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers here in the Calgary chapter. And I quickly learned of uh, Annette's long ago trip back in the 70s, late 70s, to yeah to a province, to a country in Africa, correct? Yes, Ethiopia. 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 So that was in about in the 70s? Late 70s, Terry. Long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a springboard because that was not the only trip. So what did you do in that trip? Well, actually, my husband and I spent three years in Ethiopia, Terry. And he was an agriculture specialist, and so he was teaching agriculture and managing a school farm and because I had a nursing background I did all kinds of nursing kinds of things. So you were living there for three years? We were years. living there for three years okay. with our two daughters. I delivered babies in the mud huts. I taught health in mm -hmm. the school. I pulled teeth <laughs> and really? the World Health Organization sponsored me, trained me and sponsored me to hold family planning clinics that would help uh, families to not have such large numbers of children and I also held immunization clinics out in the bush out in the countryside such phenomenal experiences Wow! in fact can I tell you a quick story sure of course uh, I the World Health Organization uh, provided the vaccines and all the materials that I would need to go out into the countryside to do immunization clinics. And we sent a runner ahead out to, and by, by Bush Telephone, okay. <laughs> which is current Bush Telephone, they spread the word that we were coming to do immunizations of their children. So he was sort of going ahead to round the troops. Yes, he went out prepared. there. We sent him out probably two weeks ahead of time. Okay. And when we got to the spot, it was a huge, huge tree, mm -hmm. probably 200 feet across in the shade. There were more than 250 families waiting to have their children immunized. Wow. It was absolutely phenomenal. I had a team of other foreign uh, people helping me. I had trained them. I had organized them, you know, to so that we each knew exactly what we would do, you know, to help these families. But it was phenomenal to see 250 families no waiting. And there were no telephones. It was all by Bush telephone. And this was long before the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Absolutely. So you were already a pioneer. That's with right. Bigger things to come by them. And, and also the, the family planning clinics went the same way. People would come to me and I would educate them. I would have a room full of women and I would educate them into their own feminine health and wellness and also the various methods of family planning. And then depending, and I would examine them thoroughly and then I would determine what was the best, best method of family planning, okay. whether it was condoms Hmm. or whether it was uh, uh, birth control pills, or I inserted intrauterine devices to hundreds of women. Wow. So it was really, you know, some of, the, some of the families would have as many as 14 and 15 children. And so they were just thrilled when, when it could help them to not have, because everyone was so poor, mm -hmm. uh, it was really, Really wonderful that they family planning. Yes, the family planning came in, and and obviously uh, you must have uh, made good use of an interpreter. Oh yes, a translator. Absolutely. I so. mean, I spoke I spoke the language, but not uh, not enough to be able to lecture these women in mm -hmm. you know in the technical terms. But so I had a translator with me and had a great time. Wow. And I del I delivered a lot of babies 
in the mud huts. I never dreamed that's what I was going to do when I got over there. Really? But once I got over there, the things just opened up and I was... I was okay. amazed at all the wonderful experiences okay. I had. Did you ever get a chance to maybe put uh, put your memoirs together in a book about those or a diary? Probably you were so busy. Plus, in your off time, uh, you probably took in a lot of the culture, uh, the local rituals, their pastimes. That's right. We, I didn't. I've never written a book, and many people have asked me to. I did a lot of speaking once we came back. It was a very, very difficult time in the Ethiopian history. Mm -hmm. The uh, communist revolution had was taking place, okay. and there was a military government that had taken over, and there was actually genocide going on while we were there. And you know, it was it's a beautiful country, and we loved the people, but there were a lot of very difficult experiences as well. Okay, but uh, so what? I, so all that you did there was uh, one of the many contributions of having helping them rebound That's right. and come back to their own well-being. You know, uh, Terry, probably one of the most exciting things that came as a result of that experience is one day, right here in Calgary, Alberta, three years ago, I was shopping in a, in a well-known store here in Calgary, and I could hear in the next aisle, I could hear two women speaking in the Amharic language, which was the language that the Ethiopians spoke. Okay. And I understood what they were saying. You know, it tickled my, my memory bank, opened up. And I thought, I want to meet these women. And, and when we got to the end of the aisle, I greeted them in their language. Well, they were astonished that this, really? this Caucasian <laughs> woman knew their language. They wanted to know why, you know, how I knew their language. So I told them where my husband and I had been and how long yeah. we'd been there. And one of the women, she got tears in her eyes. And, and she, I told, when I told her the school where we were working, she said, my husband attended that school. Just a minute. And she really? got him on the cell phone. And he was actually crying on the other end of the line really? because he had attended my health classes wow. in that school where we were. We've become wonderful friends and we get together with that family two, three times a year, every year. And But the thing is, Terry, he was attending our school. He was living in a mud hut with his mm -hmm. grandfather that I could actually see from my kitchen window. <laughs> he was living in a mud hut, attending our school, attending my health classes. Wow. He could still remember the things that I taught him. Mm -hmm. Today, he is a registered nurse, working in a wonderful job here in Alberta yeah. and living in a beautiful home in Chestermere. Wow. That's the value of education. And it, it, my husband and I were just thrilled to see the difference from mud hut to a professional nurse and a beautiful home. And that, that launched him into, that launched him into, into yes. the healthcare. Yes. Uh, One day. And then he connected us with several other students that had been there. When we were there, talked to my garden boy, wow. our garden boy, wow. who today is an engineer living in Finland. Okay. And we talked to him long distance. Nice. So, nice. you know, to, to see the transformation from then to now is just remarkable. Sure. And he doesn't live that far from here. No. So you, you can uh, visit him anytime you we want. Get, yeah, that's right. We so, get together. So we is... have meals together and just... We just have a wonderful, wonderful friendship. Interesting. And uh, you get a chance to reflect back yes. on those times as well. Yes. yes. Wow. So you lived there for three years. Three years. And, uh, and after that, you, you, came back, you came back to Canada. Yes. And, uh, but that not, that's <coughs> not the first and the last time, because I no. think in 2012, you went uh, back again to, is it uh, Uganda? Uganda. Okay. So you went... Back to, uh, there in 2012, Uganda. Yes, I was invited to speak at a global women's summit. Mm. Um, I'm author of the book, Forgiveness, the Mystery and Miracle. And as you and your listeners know, Uganda, there was a huge genocide that went on in Uganda mm. under the, you know, 
under the leadership of Idi Amin. Mm -hmm. And then after him, another leader as well. And there were more, close to a million people that died during okay. that genocide. And so uh, when they had this Global Women's Summit, they invited me to come and speak to women. And they wanted me to speak about forgiveness. Forgiveness, okay. Because many of those women had, had come from just horrible situations. Either they had lost their family members or they themselves had, right. had been or, injured. Maybe some of them orphans. had been, or they were orphans. And um, so I spoke to these women about forgiveness and letting go of the past mm -hmm. that they could move on and the women also I they the women are the burden bearers in that country mm -hmm. and so I encourage them to be able to forgive those who have kept them oppressed mm -hmm. um, in their roles not be bitter no and no. just move forward and and, and uh a plan for a better life. You're absolutely right. For themselves. Then my husband and I were taking on a speaking tour in uh, in Uganda where we spoke to thousands of high school students. Okay. And there again I was speaking about forgiveness. And so many of those students would crowd around me to tell me their stories mm. about having someone tragically, you know, the trauma that those young people have gone through, the people in that country, the trauma that they have gone through has just been enormous. enormous. They wanted yeah. to tell their stories and so I was there to, to mm -hmm. help them. I wish I could have stayed longer to hear more stories, mm -hmm. but um, it, was, it was phenomenal to be able to give them encouragement that they can forgive and let go. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that they are saying it's okay what happened. That's not what forgiveness was about. Forgiveness no, yeah. is making the choice to mm -hmm. heal and move on and not hang on to those chains and bitter of bitterness and resentment yes. and hatred. And uh, I guess um, uh, the fact that they came through that all and survived is uh, a huge blessing. Oh. It's almost like some of them might feel that they've been chosen for what reason? Probably to help others as well. And they too. are strong. Those people are strong people because of what they've come through okay. and really determined to make something of their lives. So it was thrilling to be there Interesting, and yeah. to interact with them. They're a loving, beautiful people, mm -hmm. beautiful people. And the same with the Ethiopians. We just, I, and I, my husband and I felt very fortunate that some philanthropists here in Canada sponsored us nice. to go to Uganda. Sure. Uh, because they don't have a lot of money to be able to invite a speaker like myself to come over. So there were some wonderful people who sponsored okay. us. So how long how long were you there in twenty twelve? We were there, the, we were the there almost two weeks. Okay. And it was I wish we could have been there longer. Yes. But it just didn't time just didn't allow. We had to carve out the after time. your after your speaking sessions I imagine there were a lot of one on ones that people yeah. wanted to there were uh, some but, but we also had to travel you know, like one of the schools we went to, there were 1,500 students there waiting for us when we got there. And it was out in the countryside. Oh. And we had to go <laughs> over these bumpy roads and ruts and through the trees and no no highways. And so we couldn't stay a long time because in order to find our way back to Masaka where we were stationed. Sure. So um, we couldn't stay a long time and it was oh, it was hard to pull myself away okay. from those students that were clamoring mm. to talk to me talk to also had the privilege of speaking to um school those school administrators and to their faculty mm -hmm. as well you know to talk to them because they too had experienced trauma and uh, they were so grateful that we had come mm -hmm. to share with them so th they were probably the fact too that you're from the west Yes. That uh, that they realized that uh, uh, somebody knows about them. That they weren't invisible. That weren't invisible. They weren't that invisible. That somebody somebody cares for them, and that's on like on the other side of the globe from that's here. That's right. Yeah. So it must have been uh, very inspiring for them. So that was your last trip. That was our last to, in trip in twenty twelve. We've okay. always wanted to go to also to Rwanda, where there had been tremendous genocide mm -hmm. as well. But we haven't done that yet. But we really would like to go to Rwanda. Still on your bucket list. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. Still on your bucket. Good for you. Good we, for you. We're always open, 
if if doors open for us to do things like this, we're always open to oh, walking great. through those doors. That's great. Amazing story. I'm glad I I'm glad I uh, I, I I followed up with that because I I heard the word Ethiopia at one of our meetings. Wow. At one of our caps meetings, and I says I have to talk to you more about that. I think there might be a good story about that. It's the value that we in the West can always lend to a developing uh, country and, uh, you know, help them out uh, you know, any way we can. Inspire uh, them. Delivering babies in the mud huts, it just brings back a memory yes. or several memories of uh, sometimes they would come and knock on my door in the middle of the night and, they'd, and the man that was there would say, my wife is sick. So oh. I knew oh. that she was in labor oh. having a baby and so... My husband and I depended on where they were. Um, sometimes we would get into our four-wheel drive and the, they would lead us out into the bush and out into mud huts and we didn't know where we were going. Okay. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we would go by motorcycle. I'd climb on, the, on my husband's really? motorcycle behind him with a big backpack on my back. One time we were going on the motorcycle and they had several people stationed that were like, it was like a relay. Someone would run ahead for maybe a kilometer. Someone would meet them there and then they'd carry us, they'd lead us another direction until we got to the right place. Wow, like a relay race. Like to, a relay race. To make sure, because there's, there's wild animals out well, well? the wild animals were not a problem, but just home. to, you know, there are no roads or streets, there's just so trails. But one time we were, we were riding along, I was on the back of the motorcycle and coming down this very narrow path was a donkey loaded with a mound of wood on its back. Oh yeah. And as we were riding along, my <laughs> husband was moving over as far as he could get, you know, to give room for the donkey too, because a donkey, he didn't care what we were doing. Yeah. But in the, <laughs> just the very tip of his handlebar caught, caught the wood on the back of the donkey's uh, thing on his back mm. and twisted us like that i flew off the motorcycle right into a cactus <laughs> patch <laughs> but you know sometimes uh there were times when my husband would be there in the middle of a mud hut with me there the only light would be uh the fire in the middle of the hut mm. and so he would hold the flashlight while i delivered the baby wow and uh then there were other times women came from a long distance when they heard that I was there and I was delivering babies. Okay. One woman rode a donkey 50 kilometers really? to be there so I would deliver her baby. Wow. You know, it was... Um, no kidding, that couldn't have been a very comfortable 50 kilometers for... Uh, no, and she stayed there. She stayed there for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, she came early. And the, the, the mud hut that she was staying in was so tiny. Really? But it, we got a picture the next day of her sitting outside holding her baby and me there. So, so that was like the infancy of midwifery as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think they'd be flabbergasted to know that midwifery is such a big thing here now. Uh, Mid, so. the, speaking of midwifery, the midwives would always come and watch how I delivered the oh, baby. Okay. They would I was going to say, did you get a chance to teach some of them? They came so. and watched and I would talk. Some of them wouldn't understand, hmm. but they uh, but they watched to see what I would do and how I would treat the mother and how I would talk softly to her. But I'll never forget one time. <laughs> I mean, Terry, I'm full of stories. One time I was uh, delivering a baby and after the baby had been born and everything had gone well, the, the placenta, the afterbirth, yeah. wasn't coming out. It wasn't being delivered. And I yeah. was using all the techniques that I could think of, all that I knew, and I just couldn't get that afterbirth, the placenta, to be delivered. And one of the midwives looked at me and she said, just a minute. She went into the other part of the hut and she came out with a tablespoon that had kibe and that's a special butter that they use that has seasonings in it and it's and she she came over for me to smell it and I went like that I didn't like the smell of it okay. and she put the she and she had this mother sitting up on the on a on a log a rolling log had the mother sit up on that another woman down 
in front of her between her legs, holding on to the umbilical cord. Okay. And she passed this tablespoon of kibe underneath the woman's nose. And then she pinched her nose and op made her open her mouth. And she put that in her mouth. And the woman began gagging. And as she gagged, a woman from behind pushed on the top of her uterus she was gagging and retching, and the woman that was holding on to the umbilical cord gave a little tug, and out came wow. the placenta. So they had their own. And they uh, had technique. their own. They had technique. their own techniques. Wow. I'll <laughs> never forget that as long as I live. So you learned something from oh, them, absolutely. although you can only use that there. That's right. You wouldn't have that that butter solution here. That's the equivalent right. of theirs. So I delivered wow. twins, I delivered babies by breach. I you know, I I had amazing experiences to have. So uh, out of all those, were there any uh difficult, unfortunate deliveries, stillbirths, complications, uh something you can't really do much about? You know, uh this yes, one uh, an most unforgettable experience. Yeah. It was a it was a breach delivery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing everything that I knew how, you know, I had studied and, and I had delivered uh, babies that were coming, you know, the wrong way. Sure. And so I, I got, reached my finger up in there and got the little leg out and then got another leg out and brought the hips out. And then I got one shoulder out and the other shoulder, but I couldn't get the head out. Mm. I could not get the head out. And I was praying and I took this baby and I lifted it up over the mom's abdomen, thinking that I could stretch the stretch the birth canal. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get it out. And I knew that that umbilical cord was being pressed against the baby's skull. Mm -hmm. I only had moments. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. And suddenly I felt the life of that baby mm -hmm. ebbing. I felt the baby die right there in my hands and I was weeping. You know, wow. I, I thought I'd done something wrong. I was ready to give up, not ever doing another one. Mm. We actually had to load that mother mm. and her baby in a four-wheel drive yeah. and drive her to the a hospital. hospital. And they, the doctors there, got to know me. They trusted me. Mm. And I told them, I said, I've tried everything and I cannot get this baby out. Yeah, and yeah. come to find out the baby was hydrocephalic. So it wasn't my fault. Mm. But oh, what a, what a tragic trauma it was. To go through, yeah. Oh, and I tragic imagine. for that mother. Yes. Because we had to load her with a, with a dead baby. Yeah, still. Hanging out of her yeah, body. Hanging out of her. That's, you know, that was, wow. that was the most horrible experience. That's of, an uncontrollable, yeah, yeah. uncontrollable it, But I was, thing. I was grateful it wasn't yeah. my fault. I guess C-section is not an option there. No, no, no. They had to, there it was were things just that they had to all do. Natural. To, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, amazing story. <laughs> <laughs> nice to know that it's still on your bucket list to, to go back. And, uh, but at least you keep in touch with the people that you met and connected with back uh, then. Yes and came full circle. So amazing story. Thank you for sharing it. Well, thank uh, you for asking. For, it's, you know, to, to relive some of those memories is, is really wonderful mm -hmm. because they're beautiful people. And when we can go into other countries and serve them with our skills, with sure. our abilities, with our passions, with, you know, and sometimes we don't know yeah, yeah. what we're going to be facing or what we're going to do. Exactly. But to be able to to share from the wealth of our experience, to share with people in other countries. Sure. And you probably learned a lot from them as well. Oh, absolutely. So it's a two -way I learned street. to I really learned to love them. Mm. Well, I wish them. there'd be a book out on it. I'd be the first one <laughs> first one to buy it. Those well, those memoirs you. are yeah. Maybe even uh, just the act of writing the book itself would would bring back a lot of uh, memories. It uh, would. It certainly you, would. Yeah. Good experience. Well, thank you so much, Annette, for sitting down with me finally. Uh, Annette is very busy, keeps very busy, so it was uh, challenging, but I would have waited longer than this to get <laughs> the, the story. I guess I wanted to find out more about your journeys with your uh, husband, there in Uganda and Ethiopia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Jared. so much. It was my pleasure for sharing indeed. that with us. And thank you to all of you for joining us for this episode of Out of Country. Thanks for watching.